Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's online cardiac college session. Uh, my name is Paul O. I'm the medical director in the Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Rehab Program. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you today again. And, and uh, I am presenting today's session along with my wonderful colleague, Rene Kanidis, uh, who is a kinesiologist and certified exercise physiologist. Uh, she is one of our uh, clinical coordinators in the program. And together we're going to be chatting about uh, knowing your risk factors uh, as a very important topic for discussion. We will be presenting the materials together and alternate on some of the slides as we move along. And we do appreciate that many of you have taken the time from your busy days uh, to link in with us again. A uh, couple of quick reminders, and we're reducing the, the length of these kinds of housekeeping slides, but we just did wanna say once again that these sessions are for your education only. If you have a, a specific issue uh, around your risk factors, treatments, medications, that uh, we would uh, implore you to uh, connect with your healthcare providers for some specific advice in the question and answer period, which is always uh, a fun part of these sessions uh, for, for our team. We'll be happy to look at some of these items along with you in a general sense. Um, and speaking of questions and answers, if you will uh, be oriented to the screen. I think you are all very good at this now through the question and answer uh, section of the platform. If you will enter in your items there, we will come to them in good time uh, as we move through the presentation. The goals for this session in particular, uh, we hope that by the end of this uh, uh, 30 minutes or so that you will be able to identify the common risk factors for heart disease. Importantly, identify the behaviors to help you manage these risks. And, and my colleague Rene will be leading that part of the discussion. Um, and I will add a little bit of color commentary on why these risk factors are indeed important in the context of heart disease. Um, and uh, the action item for you is to talk to your doctor and other healthcare providers about your specific risk factor profile and the desired targets. A little bit of uh, setting the scene. Why is this important to you? Why should this be important to you to know about risk factors? Well, everyone can have risk factors and we'll, we'll talk about what those things are. Things that um, conditions, underlying uh, issues in our genetics, in our family, uh, in our environment, in, in our health behaviors that may uh, increase the risk of us developing heart problems or stroke or cognitive issues or diabetes or other issues down the road. So if we really want to impact on development of heart disease or other major cardiovascular events in the future, then identifying those risk factors uh, as an intermediate step is really important. And then taking the steps today to address those risk factors is critically important. Uh, Renee, uh, uh, I know you're online with me. We are uh, very much uh, separated in space to respect physical distancing, uh, and we will alternate in this presentation. So uh, let me turn the commentary over to Renee Kanidis at this point. Thanks, Dr. O. Um, so there are some risk factors uh, that we don't have control over, that we cannot change. And those would be uh, our age, you know, we're all getting older, uh, sex, congenital, um, things that we are born with, and our family history. So, uh, you know, if our, in our family, if anyone has had a heart attack or heart disease, these are risk factors for heart disease, but we can't do anything about these. We can't change them. But there are many risk factors that we do have some control over that we can, um, our behaviors can influence these factors. And so that would be your level of fitness, uh, your cholesterol numbers like HDL, LDL, triglycerides, your blood sugar, your blood pressure, waist size, coping well with stress, depression, or poor sleep, 
and uh, consumption of alcohol or and smoking. So our goal will be to go through each of these in turn, provide some commentary about why these things are called risk factors, and then uh, as we've articulated, identifying the behaviors that, that you can uh, embark on or continue to maintain uh, that can have some positive effects on each of these modifiable risk factors. All right, so having a low fitness level, um, that is a risk factor for heart disease. And uh, this is because having a low le level of fitness is related to uh, various chronic diseases and uh, early death. So the higher your fitness level is, um, the longer, we know from research, the longer you'll live and the better quality of life that you'll have. And this is shown in uh, a number of statements from physical activity organizations, from health groups, from governments. Um, and, and we want to call out this particular article that was published just within the last couple of years. And we thought that this was very important because it came from a, a large body, the American Heart Association. And, and for, for decades, the American Heart has been um, really focused on uh, developing or, or promoting innovations in heart health. And, and sometimes they would talk about surgeries or procedures new medications, uh, electrical devices. But what we saw as, as an important advance at this time was the American heart for the first time in its history acknowledged that cardiorespiratory fitness was indeed an, a, a, a critically important parameter in defining what happens to us in the future. They thought that it was actually important enough that it should be identified as one of our vital signs. So in every encounter that you might have with a healthcare practitioner, not only should we look at blood pressure and heart rate, maybe temperature, but we should be looking at fitness as well. And, and this graph, as Renee has alluded to, identifies some data from a study of about uh, 13,000 men and women who were followed for, for many years. So at baseline, uh, each of them had a fitness test and the, the levels of fitness were categorized as low, moderate, or high. And then on the y-axis, the height of the bar denotes the risk of dying subsequently over the next several years. And I think we can appreciate very clearly that people who had the lowest level of fitness indeed had the highest risk of dying and developing heart disease uh, over the subsequent number of years. And then the corollary is people with high levels of fitness indeed have very low rates uh, of death or heart disease. Um, and this clearly makes the point that fitness is one of those really critical modifiable risk factors. Sometimes it actually gets lost elsewhere in cardiovascular care. In the setting of rehab programs, of course, we are super focused on fitness as one thing that we can work on on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, Renee? Great, right. so the, the target for fitness is that we want uh, your fitness level to be as high as possible. So, and you can achieve this by uh, completing regular consistent exercise based on the advice from your cardiac rehab specialist. All right. So moving to our, our, our next item here, uh, talking about cholesterol profiles, I'll, I'll lead this part and then bring Renee back to speak to our health behaviors that may impact here. Uh, we've had uh, discussions around cholesterol in uh, prior sessions in, in the last couple of weeks. And, and this cartoon, uh, again, typifies uh, the development of atherosclerotic plaque in arteries. And, and this uh, almost represents like a, a decade of life. Uh, the first one where the arteries are pretty clean might be somebody at the age of 20, and then 30 to 40, 40 to 50, uh, 50 to 60, where we see these plaques really building up. Uh, and we recognize that people with high cholesterol more often have blockages in their arteries. 
I'll pull on this study a couple of times in the next bit of discussion. Uh, there have been numerous examples of epidemiologic studies uh, that have been published in the literature. Epidemiology refers to patterns of disease across populations. And, and this is one that is very relevant to the cholesterol or lipid literature and our understandings of heart disease. Uh, and it was called the Seven Countries Study. It was, it was initiated a few decades ago, and it looked at the relationship on the one axis of, of different levels of cholesterol. That's showing along the bottom line here, that as cholesterol, the total value of cholesterol goes from very low to very high. And on the y-axis, the, the height of the line refers to uh, mortality related to coronary heart disease. Um, and this was conducted in seven countries. That's not a surprise because that's what the title of this is. But it looked at uh, different countries across Europe, in the north and in the south, in, in the United States, in Serbia as another country uh, from the um, from the European continent, as well as Japan uh, as another observation from Asia as a different kind of population. While there may be variations from country to country, the general line I think we can appreciate is that if the cholesterol values were very low, the risk of heart disease mortality was also very low. Wh whereas in, in places like the United States or in northern parts of Europe, where cholesterol values might go up very high, either because of genetics, diet, uh, family, uh, other kinds of issues that the high levels of cholesterol are also associated with the highest levels of mortality. Now, you might find some studies that report some slight variations on this, but, but this seems to be a fairly consistent relationship uh, across many populations. So that's part one high cholesterol, high heart disease. This somewhat complicated graph is meant to represent, well, what happens when you start to intervene? Um, so for orientation, um, across the bottom, again, are cholesterol values. This time we're talking about LDL cholesterols, those lousy, low density lipoprotein cholesterols. That's the particle that is most closely associated with risk of heart disease, and that is shown on the y-axis. In this case, the risk of death or myocardial infarction uh, over the course of the next five years. The uh, gray-blue line represents the relationship between cholesterol and heart disease in people who have never had a problem before. And you can see that there is a relationship uh, over the cholesterol values. It's not very steep, but there is a relationship. Each of the dots and circles represents a different new study that has been done over the last 30 years that kind of adds to this relationship. The orange line represents people who were studied after experiencing a heart attack or stroke or some other kind of cardiovascular event. And you can see that the relationship there is um, kind of steeper. That is the cholesterol, if you've already had a heart attack, has a much more um, defined impact on future risk of a second or a third heart attack than if you've never had one before. The other piece of orientation here is that, for instance, if you focus on this orange line, you'll see that there's a number of, of dark or uh, filled in squares. And those represent um, populations in which people did not receive any treatment. And you'll see that the majority of the filled in squares lie out to the right here, meaning that people that did not receive treatment with diet or medications had the highest risk of having uh, heart disease, and they also had the highest levels of cholesterol. Conversely, if you look at the left-hand part of this orange line, you'll see a bunch of open squares with numbers. These represent groups who are in large studies that received medications and, and had good dietary interventions. As a result of those interventions, they had lower levels of cholesterol, and they also had lower levels of risk of heart disease, death, or heart attacks. And 
this represents in totality several hundred thousand people uh, of experience within the clinical trials that informs this kind of paradigm that higher cholesterol, higher risk of heart disease, do some good interventions that may involve diet and medications and other health behaviors, you can lower this risk appreciably. So turning to Renee, so what can we do about poor cholesterol profiles? Okay, thanks, Dr. O. Um, so as, as Dr. O explained, uh, the higher your cholesterol, the higher risk for heart disease. Um, and so often uh, this is important because people with high cholesterol will have a higher chance of blockages in their arteries, which leads to heart disease. And so the, the targets based on this information is uh, for those um, with heart disease in order for secondary prevention is to have the LDL cholesterol uh, less than two the HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, so we want that to be higher, so that one to be over one. And then the triglyceride level, uh, the target is to be less than 1.7. Uh, so um, moving on to, sorry, I, I'll just go back to cholesterol and just mention, um, to summarize the behavior that Dr. O mentioned. So. Uh, choosing the food that you eat and taking your medicine for cholesterol, those are the behaviors that um, can help you to manage this risk factor. So for blood sugar, um, it's important to manage blood sugar because higher levels of sugar in the blood can damage the arteries and nerves in the body. And uh, presenting a little bit of the the epidemiology and the clinical history around this, uh, that there are many studies that have related diabetes and the risk of heart disease or stroke. Uh, this graphic uh, from the International Diabetes Federation looks at the risk of, of cardiovascular disease in people uh, who are middle-aged, uh, who are living with diabetes in countries like Canada uh, or Europe, um, or other high to middle income countries. And one of the striking findings is that if you do a survey of people living with diabetes in their middle years, is up to 41% of people living with diabetes also have a history of cardiovascular disease. So there's this striking overlap between these conditions. Uh, some have even said that living with diabetes is almost the equivalent of having heart disease in terms of future risk. And you'll see that some people will tell us specifically about a risk of having had a heart attack before, but also many people may have experienced a, a neurological event in the brain uh, called a stroke. So very strong overlap of, of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes in, in our middle years. Um, this complex uh, slide was meant to appeal to the science-y types in, in the audience. And, and really what it says is that we know that people living with diabetes will develop more coronary heart disease. So shown in the lower left part here, that is the atherosclerotic plaque buildup over time that may be accelerated by having diabetes as well. And you know, many really thoughtful science projects over the last number of decades have shown that there's many pathways that contribute to this. So for instance, kind of moving around the clock from nine o'clock to three o'clock. So we know that for instance, that um, some people with diabetes may also be more prone to developing infections. And there is this hypothesis that if we get certain kinds of infections, that that might actually damage the walls of our arteries that then make us more predisposed to develop that atherosclerosis. Next candidate is we know that in both diabetes and in heart disease, there is some degree of inflammation. That is that there is angriness. Uh, there are chemicals that are floating around in the body that make um, surfaces more inflamed. It's the same kind of things that give us rashes or joint problems. Think of that kind of angry attack inside of our blood vessels. Well, that can happen in the setting of diabetes and heart disease. 
uh, coming around to the top here, that there are theories that having high blood sugar, which is characteristic of some people living with diabetes, well, if you've got too much sugar floating around, well, that can start to uh, damage some of the proteins that are floating around in our, our system as well, like on blood vessels. Um, so these called advanced glycation end product. That's what AGE stands for, meaning that we can actually cause some, the sugar may actually cause some damage to those blood vessels. And this notion of oxidative stress uh, or so-called rusting, that high sugar may lead to blood vessel damage and think about rusting in your arteries. Then moving further over to the right-hand part of this slide, that one of the features of living with diabetes is that we may not be able to utilize the sugar and the insulin so well in our bodies at the level of muscle tissues, fat tissues, blood vessels. Um, and the so-called resistance to insulin has been associated with a number of problems, including HTN stands for hypertension or high blood pressure, endothelial dysfunction, the lining cells of the arteries may not work as well as they should. Um, so this is another characteristic of diabetes and heart disease. Uh, we've just finished talking about cholesterol problems and why that might be bad for the heart. In the setting of diabetes with heart disease, we know that there may be even more difficult cholesterol problems like LDL levels may be higher, the bad stuff triglycerides may be high, higher, which makes our, our metabolism more difficult. And HDL, the protective stuff, may be lower as well. So this is not a favorable cholesterol profile in this setting. And then finally, the thought is thrombosis or tendency to blood clotting may also be higher if we're living with both diabetes and heart disease. And we need to be mindful of that. So there's many pathways that may lead to more blockages in our arteries and the development of more heart disease. So that's idea number one about why this might be a common problem. The other kind of issue that sometimes comes up for people living with diabetes is that uh, having all of those kinds of issues that we've just described going on may lead to impairments of the heart function as well. And what these three cartoons are meant to represent is that in the middle is the anatomy of the normal heart. And we went through this in detail last week with, with our colleague Rob. And when this is working well, the blood is flowing through the four chambers and entering and exit really smoothly and pumping around all that oxygenated blood. <coughs> Excuse me. What we have found is that people living with diabetes may be prone to a couple problems. One is over time, if there is accumulated heart damage, the heart may stretch out and become big and baggy. This is called systolic heart failure. On the other hand, some people living with diabetes again, some of those abnormal proteins that are affected by sugar may lead to changes in the structure of the heart. And I think you can appreciate in this right-sided cartoon that the walls of the heart are thicker. And as a result, they don't relax very well. The heart doesn't fill as easily. And we feel, out, feel more tired out and not able to do things. This is called diastolic heart failure. And that is seen also in people living with diabetes. I'm just gonna skip the sciencey thing there. Um, so then one other observation is that there may be differences by biologic sex as well. So if we want to pay particular attention to women who are living with diabetes, well, what the, the, this population-based studies also tell us uh, that women with diabetes compared to women without diabetes, are more likely to develop heart disease. And that may be as high as four times more likely, which is double the risk for men. And they may experience heart problems a decade earlier. So women may typically develop heart disease in their 60s or 70s, but women with diabetes may be uh, uh, popping up in the 50s or 60s with heart problems. And women with diabetes compared to men may have a higher burden of many of the risk factors that we've talked about or that we will talk about, including 
higher levels of blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, extra uh, weight and, and uh, fat around the middle, and more imbalanced blood sugars. So, um, Renee, I've, I've actually forgotten to put in the slide that talks about what health behaviors then we might be able to engage in. Uh, so for the health behaviors for diabetes, um, there are lots. So uh, first of all, taking your medicine as prescribed will help to manage your blood sugar. Uh, exercise is a great way to help manage blood sugar because every time you move a muscle, every time that muscle contracts, it is using up the sugar that's in your blood. So great way to, to manage your numbers. Um, as well as uh, managing blood pressure down the line also helps with diabetes. And um, coping with stress is another great behavior to help manage diabetes because if you are chronically stressed and you have stress hormones that are running through your body all of the time, that can um, also lead to the inflammation pathway and, and um, make the diabetes progress more and then leading to heart disease. Great, thanks Renee. All right, next, next up. Okay, high blood pressure is another risk factor on, on its own for heart disease. Uh, this is important because if you have chronically um, unmanaged high blood pressure, that can damage the walls of your arteries over time. And once again, let's dive into epidemiology. Gosh, the, this group is learning a lot about uh, the ways we can look at medical science. Um, and going back to that seven country study, looking at different regions of the world, uh, again, interesting, consistent results. So on the bottom axis, we can see that blood pressure is going up steadily uh, in these different population groups. Uh, will remind us that an upper level of about 140 is about as high as we like to see in terms of systolic blood pressure. On the, on the upper vertical axis is represented mortality related to uh, cardiovascular disease. And we see that when we get up into these higher blood pressure levels, uh, again, especially in Northern Europe, United States, and, um, and in Serbia, in this case, that people with the highest levels of high uh, blood pressure also had the highest risk of coronary heart disease. Um, and the couple of reasons that we might see this, gosh, this slide should look familiar to you now, that we talk about diabetes and heart failure. Well, the same concepts apply to uncontrolled blood pressure and, and heart failure or heart disease that, uh, again, uh, normal heart, normal thickness, normal pumping, but the effects of high blood pressure that's not controlled in the first few years uh, of that happening leads to thickening of muscles that just don't relax, don't feel very well. So people with uncontrolled high blood pressure may tell us, I feel short of breath, I can't do activities like I used to do, uh, and they may even lead to fluid congestion at, at times. This is reversible if we can get the blood pressure under control. Over time, however, Blood pressure may lead to more blood vessel problems, may actually lead to overstretching of the heart over time. You can only put so much load on the heart for, for a number of years before it starts to poop out. And one of the late stages of, of blood pressure effects on the heart is to turn into a big baggy type of organ that doesn't function very well. And this definitely will lead to fluid congestion over time. And the couple of other things, we've alluded to the notion that Blood pressure is one of the things that can lead to more atherosclerosis over time. And then one final thought in the cardiovascular disease uh, kind of disease uh, uh, progression is that we might anticipate that blood pressure, especially when it's coupled with smoking, leads to excessive stress on the walls of the arteries, like this big one that goes down the middle of the chest and the abdomen. Uh, it's called the aorta. And if you put lots of pressure over there for many, many years, it can lead to this ballooning out in aorta. And the risk of having one of those things in your chest or your abdomen, maybe a tear, a rip, a leak, 
or even an advanced case of rupture. And, and there may be even one or two people on the phone who've had an experience where uh, there might have been something going on with this, or this was picked up on some kind of uh, X-ray or imaging or a CT scan, and you and your doctors and your surgeons may have decided that it was time to actually get rid of this ballooning out or aneurysm with, through a surgical type of procedure. Back to you, Renee. Okay. Uh, so high blood pressure can damage the, the walls of the arteries and or even the aorta, as Dr. O was mentioning. So our target for blood pressure is to be less than 140 over 90. However, if you are also living with diabetes, then the target is a little bit more aggressive because you also have that, that risk of diabetes on top of everything. Uh, so more aggressive guideline uh, to your blood pressure to be less than 130 over 80. And if I'll just make one more comment here that um, based upon some recent studies, you and your doctor or pharmacist or nurse or other healthcare provider may have had a conversation for your particular situation that you may have a slightly different target uh, than the ones on this slide. These, these are very good guidelines for the vast majority of individuals. Some people may, may be actually going to an even lower target, like 120 over 80, depending on your situation. There is some evidence that would say that going for a lower target for some people may actually reduce the risk of heart disease or stroke even further. And then what we often find with, uh, with some of our patient population in rehab is some people live with very low blood pressure, either naturally, that especially applies to younger women, but uh, for some individuals, if you've had an, an, an experience like heart failure, that it's not uncommon because of the multiple medications that you might go on, that you might have a pressure that is 90 or 100 systolic, so very low. Uh, and, and folks wonder, is that okay? And uh, if you are feeling well, you're not dizzy, you're able to get through your day, uh, and you've got a 90 or 100 blood pressure, that can be quite all right. On the other hand, if you find that every time you stand up that your vision goes a little bit gray and you're seeing spots and you feel like you might pass out, well, that's a sign that that blood pressure is too low and you might have a conversation with your physician or pharmacist about uh, looking at some adjustment if necessary in some of those medications. So I'll just talk about the behaviors about um, blood with blood pressure. So what you can do, uh, what action steps can you take to manage your blood pressure? So one uh, another one common behavior is taking your medicine as prescribed for blood pressure. That's going to help keep you within target. Uh, another behavior is to reduce the sodium in your diet. That can help to lower blood pressure. Another behavior is exercise. So exercise uh, can also bring down your blood pressure over time. During the moment of exercise, your blood pressure goes up a little bit, and we expect that, but it's okay because it's only for the 30 minutes, 40 minutes that you're exercising. And then after the exercise, after you've cooled down, and the next day even, your blood pressure comes down a little bit lower. Super. Moving on to the next category, Renee. Okay, so uh, a waist size is another um, measurement that we have. Um, so this is important because it depends on where you store your fat on your body. And if it's more, uh, the fat is located more centrally, close to your organs, uh, that can be more of a uh, risk to heart disease. And so we use waist size as a, a quick and an easy measurement um, to get an idea of where you're located, where your body has um, stored your fat. And this next uh, 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 slide uh, tries to typify that. I'm sorry, that's not as clear as I would have liked it to be. Um, but this is showing where we might do a waist circumference. And some of you may have actually had this kind of measurement. And while we might focus on the outside with the tape measure, the reason that that is important, as Renee has indicated, that while the outside is big, that that might also denote what's going on on the inside, this intra-abdominal fat. Sometimes it's called visceral fat, meaning the fat that goes around the organs like the intestines or the liver or the spleen or the kidneys. And this is relevant because there are studies that talk about having too much of this internal fat layer 
uh, that's different than having fat just under the skin, which everybody has for some insulation. This stuff is not so healthy because it leads to poor metabolic control and actually has an overlap between fat, uh, an excess risk of diabetes, excess risk of high blood pressure, other metabolic kinds of issues. And then it wouldn't be surprising then if we look at the relationship between waist circumference and cardiovascular risk that we can see a signal. Once again, you're getting very good at looking at these kinds of graphs of risk. And if you focus on the upper left one, just to start with, what this one is saying is, let's look at the risk of developing heart disease or dying of heart disease in men and across the bottom are different levels of different measures. And the open circle dashed line refers to different levels of waist circumference. So people with the lowest waist circumference have the lowest risk of cardiovascular death, whereas it goes up appreciably, it doubles, if your waist is at the highest level, uh, if you're, if you're kind of too levels above the, 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 the average for the population. So that's a pretty good measurement, a simple measurement with a tape measure that tells us what our risk of heart disease might be. The relationship is similar for women in the top right panel that is shown here um, for waist circumference as well. The other things that we can look at in this graph, there's two more measurements that are shown. One in the, um, the, uh, the, the diamonds filled in in gray with that gray line is the relationship of BMI, body mass index, or weight over your height. And what we have said and others have said, the reason that we don't focus on weight per se is that you can see that this line, while it goes up slightly, really does not discriminate very well. So whether you have a low-ish weight or a high-ish weight, it really doesn't change cardiovascular risk that much. More important is the waist circumference as shown in the dash line as, as a marker for how much internal fat there might be. And even better than that, that's shown in the black squares and the black line, which is the waist to hip ratio. That's probably the more refined way of defining who is at bigger risk here down the road as a measurement. So the waist size is important as a way of defining what's going on inside of us and what might happen to us in the future vis-a-vis -vis heart disease. Mm -hmm. Renee, to you. So there are some uh, targets for waist size that are based on um, larger populations. And uh, we know for with the behaviors, we know that um, exercise can affect um, the visceral fat that's centrally located around your organs. It could shift the ratio of, of uh, where that fat is located, you know, compared to your muscle mass. Um, and so we, we can use waist size um, to measure that. Sometimes waist size doesn't always change, uh, but there could be other changes going on inside. Uh, it's just hard to, to measure that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, okay, I think I said all, all this part. Um, okay. So the, the, the location of the, uh, where you store your fat around the organs, and that's why we look to measure, use waist size as a measurement. Okay. And I think these next few slides are for you, Renee. Okay. Uh, so stress and depression and poor sleep are also risks for heart disease. Um, this is important because um, high stress or chronic stress puts extra burden on your heart. Um, if you're not coping well with managing stress or depression, and if you're not sleeping well, so the, the poor sleep itself is a stress on your body. And so the target for these is to hopefully get to a point where you can cope well with the stress in your life. We don't expect you to eliminate stress because that's not realistic. Uh, there will always be stress in our lives. Um, but finding ways that you can uh, better manage the stress. And for alcohol and smoking, so a higher um, alcohol consumption is related to many health problems. It can also make the, the heart have to work harder. 
um, with chronic alcohol. And smoking, we know that damages the, the lining of the arteries as well and can make the heart work, have to work harder. So targets are for alcohol is um, to just minimize the amount that you drink. Uh, for smoking, ideally zero cigarettes each day and also remembering to avoid secondhand smoke because that can add to risk as well. And so tying it all together, this is a nice slide to show that um, all of the different health behaviors, um, they, they all link together and affect many risk factors at the same time. Um, so as I mentioned, taking your medicine as prescribed, that can help your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol. Um, eating healthy, so lower in sodium, higher in fiber, lots of vegetables and color on your plate, uh, that's going to help with blood sugar, blood pressure, um, and cholesterol as well. Getting active, so exercising, the, the behavior of exercise that links to many risk factors, that's going to help your blood pressure come down, um, help to manage blood sugar, help your cholesterol by increasing the HDL cholesterol, helping to get that one a little bit higher. Exercise uh, is a great way to help cope with stress or depression. Um, some people who are smokers and are trying to quit often comment that exercise is a way to help with cravings uh, with smoking. Uh, minding your mental health, so that's going to help with the, the stress risk factor and, and depression and, and poor sleep. Uh, avoiding smoking, if you can avoid smoking, that's going to help your blood pressure and, uh, and as well uh, damaging the, the linings in your artery. Uh, sleeping well is will help the can help to lower your blood pressure uh, as well as helps cope with stress and then uh, minimizing your alcohol consumption as well to uh, lower the risk on your heart so keeping all these in mind these are the types of behaviors that we we want you to uh, think about when you're thinking about small changes so I know we talked about action plans and goal setting a few weeks back and it's really important to make those action plans based around a particular behavior. Because at the end of the day, all that we have control over is our behavior, not necessarily um, how, how things end up in the end. So if you can focus on the behavior, you know, what do you plan to do this week? Do you plan to get more regular with taking your medicine? Do you plan to um, get in an extra walk this week? Do you plan to try a new vegetable? this week? Um, do you plan to try and make your own soup from home so that you can have a little bit less sodium uh, that you're consuming? So all these small little uh, behaviors that can all add up and then put that together and you are helping all of the risk factors on the list. So we have some resources uh, to help you out. Um, definitely talk with your own doctor about your particular risk factors. We've shown you the ones here today and these are general guidelines. Uh, so important that you have that one-on-one -on -one discussion with your own doctor and which ones, uh, which risk factors affect you. There are some tip sheets within the um, guidebook uh, and this book is located on cardiaccollege.ca. You can download the PDF version. Uh, so within the, the teal colored um, treat heart disease booklet, there are tip sheets in there that talk about each risk factor and then what you can do to manage those risks. And then as I said, making an action plan. So you might have lots of risk factors that you want to focus on, um, different ideas from the tip sheets, but then break it down one thing at a time, one behavior at a time and make an action plan for that week. And then don't forget to reach out to um, your, your healthcare team and all the resources available to you. Uh, on Cardiac College, under the Treat Heart Disease tab is where you'll find, um, again, more information about all of the risk factors that we talked about. Okay, so what we talked about uh, today with uh, Dr. O and myself, we went over all of those risk factors for heart disease, what they are, the targets, and then linking the, the behaviors to those risk factors and what you can do. But really important um, moving forward that you take that action to talk to your doctor about your own uh, individual risk factors.
All right. Uh, th terrific. Thank you for uh, bringing us home, uh, Renee. Uh, why don't we open this up to the Q&A mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll, t we'll take uh, th th these uh, questions in turn. Uh, maybe the first one, uh, what are the risk factors for aortic valve disease? And uh, maybe I'll start with this one, Renee, and, and uh, w um, you can take the next one. Um, Aortic valve disease, we talked about this last time as, you know, the doorways in our heart that are meant to open and close very smoothly. Uh, we talked about the notion that for some people, over time, the doors wear out or the valves wear out due to wear and tear. So uh, one of the big risk factors is unfortunately aging in time and wearing things out. Uh, it's true that conditions like uh, high blood pressure that puts extra strain on the heart may cause those valves to stretch in ways that we don't intend. Um, and then there are also uh, congenital reasons, i.e. some people are born with um, different kinds of valve structures. So some valves are meant to be uh, shaped um, uh, with three leaves, like, like a Mercedes symbol. Uh, and some people are only born with two. And if, if you don't have enough valves, then uh, they don't open and close as smoothly as you would like over years, and they may have a tendency to wear out. So those are the, the things that we'll pay attention to. Um, issues like cholesterol um, or, or, or other things that we usually think about with, with coronary heart disease uh, sometimes don't apply to the aortic valve problems. So, so thanks for that question. Okay, uh, next question. If your HDL, good cholesterol, is less than one, how do you increase it without increasing your LDL, the bad cholesterol? Uh, good question. Uh, so the, we know that exercise can help specifically with the HDL cholesterol. It can help to bump that up a little bit. Um, I, have, I noticed you know, just anecdotally while working within this program and working with lots of people, um, there are some people that just genetically, they have a low HDL and it can be really hard to bump that up over one, even with a lot of exercise. Um, Dr. Roy, I don't know if you want to comment any more on that. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, HDL cholesterol is sometimes the most difficult thing that we can do uh, in, in terms of change. You know, uh, other people are, are are trying things out like flaxseed and more fish and, and more omegas uh, to see if we might be able to boost up HDL. Not smoking can make a difference. Uh, for some individuals, a judicious amount of alcohol may help with HDL. We, we have to balance that, of course, against some of the downsides of alcohol intake, like it might make sugar higher in people living with diabetes. Don't drink too much because that's bad for your heart as well. Um, so I, I do agree completely with Renee that probably exercise is the best approach to this. Uh, there have been a few medications that have also been tried for HDL, including some like B vitamins like niacin. For some people, that might be helpful, but it can be tough to take for some people. Uh, there have been other uh, kind of experimental therapies that have been used for HDL that have been quite successful at changing the numbers but not necessarily the risk of heart disease. So uh, we have to be kind of mindful of, of not going too far down the road uh, of, of searching for uh, you know, answers in pills in some situations. So um, back to Renee's thought, eat well, move more, that's how we're gonna do better with our cholesterol values. And, and based upon the additional information that you provided, that it looks like the ratios of, of, of uh, of uh, bad cholesterol to good cholesterol are in good range. And keeping the LDL value well under two is probably the, the biggest thing that you can do. And as long as that LDL is down, then uh, the HDL matters somewhat less. Um, one comment uh, from one of our very astute colleagues on the phone who said, I call this a seven country uh, study, but you only see six in the legend. You're absolutely right that the seventh country was located within one of those regions. Uh, a bit of homework for you if you really want to know. Go look up the seven country study dot com. You can look at the website and find the individual country that is hidden. So thanks very much. Um, Renee, how about this one? If, if someone who, who smartly, very smartly wants to measure their own blood pressure, um, how often should we 
uh, do so to get a valuable reading? Uh, what, what, do, what do we typically recommend? Um, I think the, probably uh, if you've got your own monitor at home, um, pick one time of day, probably the morning um, after you're up and then keep that consistent and do it the same time every day. Um, so then you have a better idea of how your, uh, how your blood pressure is changing. Yeah, uh, so I agree completely at doing things consistently under the same conditions. Make sure that you rest before checking your blood pressure. And sometimes with your own blood pressure uh, monitors, uh, what we do here is sometimes when you first put on the cuff and press the button, that that causes a little bit of a pain reflex in the arm. And the first reading may be a little bit artificially high. So usually we just ignore that first one and then wait for the second one to, to get a good reading. Um, occasionally we'll, we'll look at the numbers at, at other times through the day if we have a question about it. Some people, uh, typically have a higher or, or may specifically have a higher or low blood pressure like late in the day. Like if you find you're getting dizzy uh, at a certain hour of the day, then that might be the good time to check your blood pressure just to see where it's at. So uh, you, uh, your, the, the, the comment suggests that this person might do it three times a day. That's a wonderful plan. You'll get lots of good information there. Um, okay. Uh, and, uh, oh yes, coming back, our colleague on the phone said she indeed was able to find all of those seven countries, US, Finland, Netherlands, Italy, Greece, the former Yugoslavia that was there called Serbia, I believe, and Japan. Thank you very much. Um, and the last question before we close this session out, can you keep your, Renee, can you keep your LDL low with just diet and exercise? Uh, I would say you can affect your LDL by um, eating healthy fats and high fiber and lower sodium and um, an exercise might help a little bit, but you will probably have a much bigger effect by taking the medicine prescribed to you uh, to help lower your cholesterol. Most of the cholesterol in our blood is based on genetics and how much our body makes and then less so uh, the cholesterol in our blood is from our diet. Agree completely. And <laughs> it's not an either or, right? That um, diet and exercise are cornerstones for everything that we've done. And, and I think Renee has, has emphasized that as well, that uh, whatever the risk, uh, it can be made better by eating better and moving more. And sometimes we just might need that extra medication kick to, to get our risks sort of optimized. And we'll remind you when we did our discussion about uh, cholesterol and risk that we're trying to get the LDL levels down 50% uh, from where it might've started if you've experienced a heart attack or gone through a surgery or have had a stroke, because those are the levels where we start to see uh, better outcomes. So uh, bear that in mind that it's, uh, uh, it, it's quite all right um, or it's, it's important to do the, follow the good diet and exercise, but medications may play some role for us as well. Okay. And I'd, I'll remind you of the, um, the puzzle piece slide uh, with mm. all those behaviors. And so each, you can pick and choose different behaviors and they'll have some benefit. But if you put all those behaviors together, that you'll have even greater benefit to all of your risk factors. Terrific. Well, thank you everybody for your wonderful questions. And just wrapping this up, I'd like to thank uh, uh, my colleague Renee uh, mm -hmm. for joining um, uh, me today on this uh, walkthrough of risk factors. We thank all of you for tuning in and joining us today. Uh, we hope that that was enjoyable for you and somewhat informative. Uh, we'll remind you that tomorrow is Nutrition Wednesday um, and our dietitians will be uh, having a session where they will answer your questions, all your questions, come armed uh, about uh, food and nutrition. And, and we'll remind you that if we didn't get to your question uh, during this session, we will answer those ones specifically uh, in uh, written form and we'll have those posted up. So thanks very much again. Have a great uh, Tuesday and uh, we'll look forward to reconnecting soon. Thanks, Thank Dr. Rowe, and thanks for listening. <laughs>